And um, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn with me over into your Bibles, over to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6 is where we're going to plant ourselves. Those of you that are online with us this weekend, let me say welcome to you as well. And uh, have you ever just been, and I realize God just takes us and throws us all together, and we're at different places. Some of you are at different places this morning. Some of you are just really tired right now. Some of you are just wired for whatever reason. Some of you are just kind of in the, oh, let me just see real quickly, just by show of hands. How many of you are just kind of just really, really tired right now? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are just kind of like you feel really wired, just like, you know, okay, I'm ready to go. Yes, this is it. Anybody? Nobody. Wow, okay. So then how many of you are just kind of like, well, eh, I don't know, you're not tired, but you, you just say, how many of you? I really don't care. Yeah? Okay, okay. okay. So I know who all I'm talking to this weekend from the standpoint. And, uh, um, but how many of you, you've just, you've experienced something or been somewhere where you just realize with your belief system and with God, wherever that's at right now, that something has just, specifically for if you're a follower of Christ, you've been experienced something or you've been a part of something that just stirs you, that you just, you just, you have to worship. Anybody ever experienced that before? It just stirs you to worship. Whatever it is, just some, maybe it's a sunset you've seen, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a sunrise, maybe it's a, an experience of worship that you're part of that just, um, for my family and I, it was specifically Susan and Jen and I, this past Wednesday, we were part of about 4,000 people um, in Greensboro that came together for a concert to worship, and uh, it was just phenomenal just to watch a group of people in one place at one time, even the artists that were uh, leading us through worship and different things, they kept commenting just the spirit that was in this place. And um, it was just, it just, it was just amazing to be a part of a worship experience. There's some things that we experience, whether it be on a walk or something like that, or maybe something comes to mind, maybe a song um, on the radio that just, I don't know, stirs you. Maybe maybe you traditionally, or maybe you don't feel like, like, like you know, typically you wouldn't raise your hands or something like that, or, or it's so it, you, all of a sudden you find yourself that something is unknown to you, you got your hands in the air, you're raising your hands, or maybe you just all of a sudden are crying, or whatever that is. In other words, you're drawn to the presence of God. You're drawn to God. We're in a message series, and we're going to talk about, and we've been talking about the attributes of God. And uh, we're going to have a conversation this weekend, and we're going to just discuss um, what some would say is the least popular attribute of God. But here's the thing. This attribute that we're about to talk about is actually mentioned Approximately 637 times it's estimated in Scripture. Think about it, 637 times. So some would say it is the least popular. Some would say it is the most important. But here's the thing. This attribute of God comes with a specific warning for us. Now realize that's not typically as a communicator that you want to start off Communicating stuff that says, well, here's the warning behind it. But when we talk about this specific attribute, it so often when we when we get to the point that we are able actually to rally or wrap our minds around this specific attribute. And I think it's one of the attributes of God that we maybe, if we will, and maybe it's why the why so many people struggle with it, is because it's hard for us to figure out. It's hard for us to understand. And so we, we if we talk about, you know, like, like, I don't know, the trustworthiness of God and the truths of God and who God is and all these things, there's different things I can mention that we say, okay, I believe in that. I think even this weekend we would say this attribute that I'm about to, to mention to us will say, okay, I understand it. I believe it. 
But here's the warning. If we really do understand this attribute, if we really rally around this, if we wrap our minds around this, then this attribute actually leads us so often to action. That's why I think overall we actually struggle to really understand or wrap our minds around this because how often when we walk through this weekend does it lead us to the specific actions that we're about to see. You see, this attribute of God, for so often, it shakes us up. There's something within us when we come and experience this attribute of God that stirs within us. In fact, you may be led or stirred in such a way that you feel the need to drop to your knees, knees in repentance. You may find yourself where you didn't think you'd find yourself actually face down in worship. You might say, that's not my posture of worship. My posture is to sit, my gluteus maximus right here where it's at. It's not my posture of worship to actually be face down. It's not my posture of worship to be raise my hands in the air. That is not my posture of worship. My posture of worship is not to be on my knees in repentance. You see, this attribute of God... That so often we don't want to hear about is actually the attribute of God that more than anything, actually this weekend, we need this attribute. We need to hear about it. We need to talk about it. So this weekend, I want to talk about, I want to just have a conversation about the holiness of God. Because I believe when we rally around and we understand the holiness of that there's an action behind that. So often I think we kind of fall short on understanding the holiness of God. So to do this, to really kind of start to wrap our minds around this and see, I, I want to look at what Isaiah actually experienced. And Isaiah gives us this testimony of what he experienced. Over in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 3, we read these words, and they'll be on the screens behind me. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Now, I don't think this is really a picture of so often we have a holiness. If you really look at what Isaiah, and let me just explain here, if you really look at what Isaiah is telling us, it, 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 you might say it even sounds chaotic. Uh, it might sound like there's chaos there. When you have these seraphim, you know, we'll talk about what they are in a minute, they, you know, understanding, okay, what is this? And they're flying around, and here you we're talking about that uh, the Lord is he's seated on his throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. And then there's these things. We're not really sure what they are. They're flying around. They have their face covered, their feet, and they're flying around. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy. So often we picture holiness as, shh, be quiet. That's holiness. And don't get me wrong, I can't be. But more often than not, a lot of times, we see all throughout Scripture that it's loud, it's chaotic, it's obnoxious, doesn't make a lot of sense. For Isaiah, he experiences the sound of, and it says, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now let's talk a little bit about the background of what Isaiah is sharing with us. Isaiah said it was the year of King Uzziah. It was the year that he had died. Now you may not know a lot about Uzziah, but he actually started to reign when he was at the age of 16. 
And he was king for 52 years. So think about that. How long that he was king. So everybody is feeling incredibly unstable. When the prophet says this was the year that King Uzziah died, he could have said this was the end of an era, if you will. This was a season that the people felt anxious. This was a season when people felt scared. This was when they felt unsettled. And it might even describe the way so many of us feel right now. Anxious. Unsettled about our society, about our culture, about everything that's going on. I mean, how many people ever thought that you could be, if you saw the news this week, could be riding? I, I think it was an escalator or they were walking, and the next thing, a, a fan, a hockey fan of an, well, if you're a hockey fan, maybe you might have expected this. But a hockey fan turns around and up uh, of another team and, and hits the, 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 uh, the fan, the other fan of the hockey game. Who would have thought that? You know, you turn on the news or you read the news or you listen to the news or you listen to various conversations and it just, there's a, there just seems like there's a heightenedness, if you will, of just people are on edge. That's where the people are right now. They're on edge. They're unsettled. They don't know what's next. This was the season that a lot of people would have felt so much like who we are now. Again, put ourselves there. In this turmoil, in this tension, in this anxiety, the prop. This prophet, Isaiah, saw the Lord high and lifted and exalted and sitting on a throne. And his robe filled the entire temple. And, and above him, Scripture says, as we read, that there, there, there was these six-winged creatures called seraphim that were worshiping God. Now we might ask, what is a seraph? What is a seraphim? What does it mean? It literally means burning ones. And we don't know exactly what they may look like. If you can imagine what six wings with two uh, th th then they would use to fly, two they would cover their face to shield themselves from the over overwhelming gloriness of God. With two, they would cover their feet. Why? Because they were positioned in a place of holy ground. And they were singing out, holy, holy, holy. So let's try this. You all knew it was coming, so let's just try it. If you were just beat after me, holy, holy, holy. 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 holy. Now, if you can envision to see, as Isaiah shared with us, over and over and over again, they're hearing this, holy, 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 and if you'll say it with me, it's the Lord Almighty. Holy, 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 holy. is the Lord Almighty. Holy, 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 holy. is the Lord Almighty. Holy, holy. And over and over and over and over again, they're hearing this, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. Now, think about this. In our culture, we kind of downplay holiness a little bit, don't we? In fact, for some of you, I would dare say for most of you, it kind of felt a little weird to say, when we talk about this, holy, 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 how many of you even feel a little weird? Anybody even feel a little weird over the course of time? I mean, I could have kept going. We could have went now for a while, just over and over and over again, because you got to remember, it was continual. It was going over and over and over. Now we kind of throw this idea of holiness around in so many ways, this word. In our culture, unfortunately, sometimes holy is matched with some other words that I won't say. But it can also be paired with other words that we might use. You know, anybody ever said, holy cow? Anybody? Holy moly. Holy smoke. Holy smoke. 
I was getting to that one. Holy smoke, I can't believe you went there. So what exactly does holy mean? What does holiness mean? Well, holiness means, it, it, what it means is, is to separate. It means to set apart. In the, literally in the Hebrew language, it means to cut. It means to, it is a cut above. It means, it means to separate. So in other words, what does that say? Yes, that God is separate, that God is a cut above. He is a part. So what is he cut above? What's he apart from? What is, and that would be everything. In other words, God is up here. And I don't mean, but God is set apart. From everything, everyone, and, and everything that has been created, our God, who we're in the presence of this weekend, is set apart. In fact, over in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, there's a question that's asked. Who among the gods is like you? Who is like your majest you majestic in holiness? So what is God? He is complete. Full of entire holy. He is all good. He is all pure. He is righteous and perfect without fault, without blemish. He is infinite. He is immeasurable. He is incomprehensible. So in other words, God, we have to understand, is set apart. He's different. He is self-existent. He is self-sustaining. He's self-sufficient. He is the God who was. He is the God who is. And he is the God to come. <coughs> So in this year that King Uzziah died and everybody's unsettled, the prophet Isaiah, God saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he sees these things that are worshiping him. Holy, holy, holy. And in the presence of God who is set apart, in the presence of God to whom there is no other, in the presence of holy, holy is God, Isaiah cried out, Woe to me, I am ruined. Another person would like to say, I'm, I'm undone. He said, for in the presence of God, I recognize I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people that are with unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then notice this, what, what transpires if you look on through a text, it says that one of the seraphim, he flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongue of the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Now, I want you to notice some things that actually take place here. Now, I want to encourage you to write them down in your notes. We have to acknowledge and notice what Isaiah didn't do and then also what he did do. Notice what he didn't do. Isaiah didn't join the seraphim. He didn't join in praising God. In other words, Isaiah wasn't worshiping. Ever heard that? Ever acknowledge that or seen that? If you will, per se, or allow me to say that. He didn't worship. Notice what he does do in the presence of God. He confessed. He cried out. I am unworthy. I am undone. Woe to me. I am ruined. Notice what God does to draw this confession out of Isaiah. As you look there, notice what God does. What does God do to draw Isaiah to this point? What does God do to draw these words out of the mouth of Isaiah? Nothing. 
God did nothing. He was just God. God was just God. He was just so holy that this led Isaiah to action. He was in the presence of God and he realized that in God's holiness and all that was going on, all that he could do was fall on his knees and say, I am unworthy to be here. I am unworthy to be in his presence. I am unworthy to be a part of this. I am ruined. I am a sinner. In other words, God's presence alone was enough to convict this prophet, Isaiah, that he needed forgiveness. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. Notice who is saying this. We have to acknowledge Isaiah was what? Isaiah was a prophet. What does a prophet do? A prophet prophesies, a prophet speaks on behalf, as a messenger, on behalf of God. And these words that he speaks are even, they come from, he says, even my lips are unclean. My lips are unworthy in the presence of God. I recognize that I am full of sin. Woe to me, I'm unclean. Now, I want you to notice what Isaiah and all of this, what is going on? We have to point out, and I want, I want to encourage you again to jot this down. The first thing that Isaiah did was what? He confessed his own sinfulness. He says, I have unclean lips. I am unworthy. Woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips. Who does Isaiah speak about first? He speaks about himself. He acknowledges that he himself has unclean lips, that he himself is unworthy. And then what does he do afterwards? He confessed his sins before he acknowledges the sinfulness of the rest of the community. In other words, before he acknowledged the sins of other people, he had to acknowledge his sins first. He acknowledges his sins. He says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. Huh. Think about that for a minute. He confessed his sins first. That doesn't always happen that way, does it? In fact, a lot of times people will do the opposite. A lot of, if you will, Christians will walk around pointing out everybody else's sin. Pointing out what they have done wrong or telling them what they're doing wrong. Can you believe they did this? Can you believe? Do you know what you're doing? I can't believe he did that. Now, even with social media, what do we do? We don't know. We, we acknowledge it out on social media. And there's these discussions that will actually be there about different things. A lot of Christians, it's a state of call for what it is, within God's church, capital C church, point out the sins of other people. You can only be self-righteous when you compare yourself to other people. 
Because when you're in the presence of God, here's the thing. When you're in the presence of God, notice from Isaiah, when you're in the presence of God, you're not worried about their sins. You are just aware of your own sin. So in other words, within God's church, in the presence of God, or as a father of Christ, in the presence of God, we have to acknowledge and notice our own sin and not be so concerned about the other people's sin. Because we're in the presence of the holiness of God. We're in the presence of God. So maybe the reason so often we're acknowledging other people's sin and not realization of who we are and what we've been forgiven of is because we don't realize that we're in the holiness, the presence of God. And don't think just the presence of God is just right here within these walls of this building. I, I've shared with you multiple times. and I, 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 My mom and dad had a... Um, Let's just say an interesting time raising me. I'll leave it at that. They had a lot of teaching to do. There was a lot of discussion within our home, if you will, and I'll leave it at that at times. One of the greatest gifts, though, I believe my parents ever gave me that they taught me was it? And I'm sure we did this before. My mom and dad never told me not to run in church. Never told me not to run in church. Because it was the church. Okay? They never told me not to run in church because it was the church. Now they might tell me not to run. Or Jonathan, you need to stop. Or you need to slow down. Or as mom would do sometimes, she'd say, come here. <laughs> and, and like not being very smart or intelligent after hundreds of times of having it, I would come over to mom and she'd lock it in and lock right in that shoulder and I'd be like this. And she'd hold her discussion. So you were aware of that because you were part of this discussion. And I'd be locked in like this. I guess she'd just continue. But they never told me not to run in church because it was the church. It was because I might not such and such over or whatever. Mom and dad never did that. And I don't share this with you to put mom, my mom and dad on a pedestal. I share with you the understanding because it, it was, it's been embedded in me that they wanted me to realize that wherever I was at, I was in the presence of God. That I didn't act differently here than I acted when I was at home, than I acted when I was at school. They wanted me to realize that I could run in church here, and I ran at home there, and I ran at school, or whatever I was doing, I was still in the presence of God wherever I was at. So therefore, what I didn't realize, and as I've gotten older, I understand, is realize that you are in the presence of the holiness, in the holy God, you are in the presence of God Almighty all the time. So when you wrap your mind and you acknowledge that and you realize that, then it changes the way you look at other people. It changes the way, and we'll talk about this in a minute, the way you see the mission of the church and the way you see the mission of God. Because it's not just these walls in this building. God's given us an amazing facility to use and to steward and how we use it. But God himself is in everything we do and around everything. In the presence of God, he says, Isaiah says, I am ruined. I am sinful. I am lost. I am destroyed. Notice also what Isaiah doesn't do. He doesn't have a negotiation with God, if you will. He doesn't say, um, excuse me, I know all this is going on around here, but can, can we just talk for a minute? Can we just, can we just kind of walk this through? I know, you know, I, if you allow me to get out of here, if you allow me to go forward, I promise you, I promise you, I will, I, I will never do this again, or I will never do that again. God, I'm sorry that I said that about that individual. I'm sorry for what I did. 
If you'll just forgive me right now, if you'll just forgive me, I promise I will read my Bible every day. I promise I will get a part of a small group. I promise I will be a part uh, of serving in a ministry. And we walk through his nose. Isaiah doesn't do any of this. You notice he doesn't even plead for his forgiveness. Notice what happens. God actually initiates the forgiveness himself. Don't miss this. God actually sent the, the Sarah with a burning coal that touches Isaiah's lips. God is the one who sent. And look what God says. He says, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is what? Your sin is forgiven or your sin is atoned for. You see, our God is so good that he actually initiates the atonement. In the same way that he's actually done for each and every one of us this weekend. If you look over in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, it says that, that's what, that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Not, okay, you all, the creation, y'all y'all clean up first. Y'all stop sinning. And then once all that happens, then Jesus will do this. No, we're, we're sinners. We've fallen short. Guess what? Jesus said, I will go. I will die on the cross. I will be that sacrifice. I will lay in that tomb. I will be the one to bridge that gap. That sin has caused. Separated us from God. Separating us from the holiness. I will be the one that bridges that gap. Who is God? He is holy, holy, holy. And there is no one else like him. There, was, there is no one else like God. Because there is no one else like God, because God is holy, there's a promise around that. You know what? Y'all see the promise? You know, we've been talking about this now for over a year and a half, talking about understanding the promises of God. Holding on to these promises. There's actually a promise behind it. Because God is holy, because God is set apart, the promise is that you and I can actually trust Him. In other words, if you're afraid, we can trust God. If you're hurting, we can trust God. When we cry out to Him, we can actually trust that He's actually there and He will respond. We can actually trust because God is holy that He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's always been good and He's always going to be loving. And here's the thing. There's nothing that you can do to make him love you more. Amen? Amen. But here's the other truth. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Amen? Amen? Because he is holy. There is no darkness in him. There has never been sin in him. He can't lie. You can always trust him. And I want you to acknowledge, we have to look, I want you to see because of all this, all this is transpiring between God and Isaiah. All this is going on. And all this chaos and everything. Look what he, what, what he experienced here. In his if you will, his rawness and how vulnerable he is and all this is going on. He cries out to God. Look at 
Let's look, look what scripture says. Look what he says. Scripture it just says, but then all this one says, I heard the voice, voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for what? Us. Us. Now I want you to circle the word us. You notice here, we have to acknowledge here. i got to stop and acknowledge this. He doesn't say, who will go for me? He says, who will go for us? Who is the us? It's a realization that we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We struggle so much to understand this idea of the Trinity, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to break it down to identity. And I don't have time to go into all that this weekend, but I want us to acknowledge that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are there when all this is going on. In other words, God is saying, who's going to go for us? And I want you to look and see. Write this down in your notes. It's very poignant. I want you to see who answered and how they answered. Notice the question is, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And in the presence of all this is going on, on his knees, in the realization, he says these words. Isaiah speaking says, here am I, send me. I'm unworthy. I'm a sinner. I'll go. I'll go. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, I'll do it. Why? Why? Because of God's holiness. You see all the action behind this? You see why we don't talk about it? And you see why when we struggle to wrap our minds around this? Because of God's holiness. Because of God's righteousness. Because of His goodness. Because of His atonement. Because of His, Him initiating forgiveness. To the one who had unclean lips. To the one who was unworthy. He's saying, you know what? I will go for you wherever you want me to go. You tell me where to go. You tell me what time to be there. You tell me what you need and when you need it. And I am all about that, God. My answer is yes. Now, without raising a hand, without saying, I, I just want us to think this through because we've got to deal with the elf in the room. How many of us will answer yes? How many of us are willing to say, God, whatever you want, God, wherever you need me, God, whatever time you need me, I will go. Send me. I'm all in. Send me. You want me to serve, I'll serve. You want me to worship, I'll worship. You want me to love, I'll love. You want me to forgive, I'll forgive. What is the mission? What do you need me to do? I'm all in. I'm that person. Why? Because that's how amazing you are, God. That's just who you are. In other words, let's just make it in simple terms. How in the world could I ever say no? You know, there's another time. Just real quickly, if you're familiar with the time in the life of, of the... We've talked about this um, a few weeks back, maybe a month ago back now, but we talked about this... This whole thing, you remember when Jesus had, had shared and, and, and with, with, with the people and then everybody left him and he was just there with his disciples? And you remember when Jesus looks at his disciples and says, are y'all going to leave too? Y'all remember Peter's response? Lord, where would we go? Where would we go? Peter didn't have a clue what was to come. 
He said, where, where, Lord, where would we go? In other words, I'm in. You got me? Even in his flaws, his mistakes, he, he, he even betrayed Jesus. He denied that he was even a part of the disciples later on. But then if you look over in Acts, you see him with the rest of the disciples. And you see what transpired specifically. You see in Acts 2 when this message is delivered. Why did I paint that picture? Because we have to see what transpires with Isaiah. All this has been going on with Isaiah. Isaiah said, here am I, please send me, I will go. And we have to acknowledge just over in the very next chapter. We've been talking and been in chapter 6. If you go over to chapter 7. After realization and acknowledging and being in the presence of the holiness of God. This prophet who claimed and knowing that he had unclean lips. He actually prophesied seven years, seven, seven hundred years before about the birth of Jesus. Again, one chapter later, the prophet with unclean lips, look what he says. Over in chapter 7, I believe we have on our screen, he says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. In other words, you have Isaiah in the holiness of God. And then God said, who's going to go for me? Isaiah said, send me, I'll go. And then we have him actually proclaiming, prophesying, giving truth about the birth of Jesus, about the Son of God. Sharing with the people about Jesus. I am so thankful that God did not send, that Jesus did come for the help of the demons. And he didn't come for those so called, for those who claim to have clean hands, but he came for those that are not. Over in Psalms, as we close, over in Psalms 35, David said these words. He said, with every bone in my body, with, every, with everything in my body, I will praise the Lord. And then he goes on to ask, he asks this question, who can compare with you? Who else rescues the helpless from the strong? And, and, and I want you to listen to these next words. Uh, it, it, as in preparing for this message, it just hit me. In fact, even just reading them over this morning, realization of these words that were said. He said, who else protects the helpless and the poor from what? From those who rob them. Who else protects the Christians From the helpless and the poor, for they rob you. Is that what it says? That's why we want to frame it. That's why we want to say it. How, do we have to acknowledge who else protects the helpless and the poor from those who rob them? Let that sink in. I can't go any farther with that this weekend. Let that sink in. Who else can save you? Who else can heal you? Who else can forgive you of your sin? Who else can redeem you? Who else can comfort you? Who else will never leave you? Who else will never forsake you? Who else is always there for you? If God is for us, then what? Who can stand me? Who is God? People ask, who is God? Ever had someone say, who's God? Or ever had anybody ask, so who is God to you? He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. 
He is the Lord of God Almighty. And guess what? That's enough. That's enough. When we experience the holiness of God, now let me put this in context for us this weekend. Again, we've already discussed that God isn't just here. But we have to acknowledge that God is here. That we are in the presence of the holiness of God. We're in the presence of God. 